hello hi uh, thanks for the introduction i hope everyone can hear me um can we just do a quick check so that everyone can hear me maybe uh yeah okay great uh so let me begin and uh, okay so just in case if I don't get notified because of the chat or I happen to miss it, feel free to unmute, unmute yourself and ask the questions. Uh, so today we'll talk about model interpretation. Uh, so I think first let's talk about why do we care about interpretability? So let me motivate this using an example from 1990s. Oops, uh, yeah. So in late 1990s, in one particular hospital where there was a shortage of beds, they wanted to develop a model so that they could treat high risk patients and admit them, whereas low risk patients could be treated as outpatients. So since there is shortage of beds, they don't want to take on everybody. So they want to build a model to understand and categorize risk. And the way they do this is they collect a lot of historical data and they try to predict the probability of death for all the patients with pneumonia. So the task is to predict the probability of death for all the patients with pneumonia. And uh, the way they are going to answer the second question, which is the question they're interested in is that let's say if the probability of death is beyond a certain threshold, they would say that, okay, this is high risk. So let's admit them. And they tested a bunch of models and they found out that neural models were among the best performing models. And uh, they were looking to deploy this model. Uh, and before they actually went ahead and deployed these models, someone suggested that let us build a simple rule-based classifier just to see what are the trends in our data set. And the rule-based classifier suggested this. It said that, if you have asthma, you are at a lower risk. And if you're a medical practitioner or anyone who is a medical practitioner would easily tell you that this is devastating in the sense that if you have asthma as well as pneumonia, you definitely pose a higher risk. So this particular trend is wrong. Or if you were to deploy this model, it would be dangerous for so many lives. So can anybody take a quick guess and see why uh, why this might be, for instance, the case. Why would somebody, or why would using this data, one would learn that having asthma means lower risk? Anybody, like any guesses? Yeah, one guess might be maybe the data set actually was skewed that way. And maybe the other guess is asthma and pneumonia are not correlated. Uh, these are good guesses, but not the reason I was fishing for. And uh, this actually, there is a, a much more significant problem here. So what is actually going on here is, oops, what is actually going on here is that people who came in with asthma, they were given much more intensive care, so they died less. Now, the same model is actually being used to tell the same patients that, okay, we would treat you as outpatients because you are at lower risk. So think about it. You're trying to predict the probability of death. It is indeed true that people who had asthma and people who were given much more intensive care died less. But it would be wrong to say that anybody who has asthma should be treated as outpatients. So here you're trying to make a decision before even actually giving care. But your data set, for instance, had this confounding variable about how much care was given to a patient, which was not captured. And uh, that's why you learn these counterintuitive trends like having asthma means lower risk. So before deploying models, it is a good idea to, for instance, 
know and learn about what the model is doing. This, if you think a little bit more, is also reflective of a very common trend in machine learning problems. Oftentimes we want A, but we end up optimizing B because A is hard to measure. For instance, let's say if you are Facebook, you care about meaningful interaction on the website. It's very hard to measure meaningful interaction. So what you end up optimizing is let's say clicks, which is of course, or maybe not so obviously, but might be a very different metric than what you wanted. And it might result in very funny things happening with your system, which are probably counterintuitive. So this pattern is kind of important to keep in mind because oftentimes you would want something, but you would end up optimizing something else because that's easy to measure and easy to optimize. Hopefully I've convinced you that we need to look at what models are doing, but if this is, if you're still not con convinced, I have more reasons. Some simple reasons are that, oh, uninterpretable models are actually banned. So certain laws in certain areas, like in EU, for instance, uh, citizens have a right to explanation. So any outcome that was taken for you and that affects you significantly, you have a right to go and ask why. So if your credit card loan was denied, you can go and ask why, and they might tell you that, oh, you don't have enough credit history. Also, similar to the example we saw that oftentimes knowing what the model learns helps you understand whether it will do well in the world on distributions that are slightly different than your actual training distributions. Also, there can be other reasons like if you give people explanations, they're happier to interact with an AI system. And also it helps you debug models, know what the problems are and so on. So I hope these are good reasons to think about interpretability. So despite a lot of debate about interpretability, it is still not established that what is interpretability. A lot of people work with many different definitions and sometimes those definitions are contradictory and even mutually exclusive at times. So this is the dictionary de definition of the word interpret. It simply means that to explain something in understandable terms. And we wouldn't be discussing this topic if you could just open a checkpoint and just look at the weights and see, oh yeah, I see why the bias is 0.37. It should have been 0.219 instead. This, this is clearly wrong. This is not what I want my model to learn. Since the models that we typically work with are very complicated, huge, very complex, um, we want to understand them better. So one working definition of interpretability that I personally subscribe to is this. So it says that interpretation of a model or its outcome is any insight that measurably improves user's understanding of the model. And since a user is in question here, the definition of course depends upon your audience. And another key word here is measurably. So you should be able to measure the success of your interpretation. Uh, we will talk a lot about evaluation and different interpretation techniques. But so far, if anyone has any questions, please feel free to ask. Okay, so let's go ahead. So to open this perpetrated black box of deep learning, people have resorted to two broad themes. One of the theme is that, what is my model learning? So this is more of a global understanding. In general, let's say, is my model understanding about syntax adequate? The second theme of opening this black box or interpretation is, can you explain a particular outcome to me? Let's say a particular loan was denied, let's say the predicted price of the house or so and so, can you explain why? So these are basically the two broad themes. The first one is more of a global understanding of the model. What kind of trends it learns? Does it have understanding of certain properties we believe it should? And the second aspect is more about explaining one particular outcome. So this is more local in nature. 
So let's dive deep into both these methods. So first of all, uh, let's talk about what is our model learning. So a lot of work in this direction involves probing. You would have read about probing in the survey, which was posted on the group. And uh, to give you a very quick brief overview of probing, how probing works is that let's say you have a particular architecture which you're trying to understand. Let's say in this particular case, you want to understand this sentence embedding. Um, and let's say you want to understand whether this particular network trained to do a task like sentiment analysis, does it, for instance, know anything about the tense of the sentence it's classifying sentiment about? Maybe the tenses are important, maybe they're not important, but you are just curious. You want to understand whether this model knows about the tense of the sentence, for instance. What you would typically do is you will take the sentence representation of this model and train a different diagnostic classifier to learn to predict tense. And you will use a different classifier, maybe or maybe even similar classifiers, and you will use a different data set which is all about tenses. So maybe you will have a small data set like thousand sentences for which you have tenses that are known and you're training this classifier just to get a sense of whether the representations have a notion of tense in them so that I can decode by learning a lightweight classifier with a small amount of data. And now if this classifier the classifier in red, the diagnostic classifier, if this classifier is able to detect tense on unseen examples, then that means there is information about the tense that is actually captured in the sentence embeddings. So this is at a very high level, the idea of probing. Of course, you need not probe the sentence representations, you can probe the word representations or intermediate representations and so on. So Different probing research varies on what components of the networks are, for instance, inspected. It also looks at what different architectures are inspected. It also looks at what is the property that you're interested in. So there are lots of papers with different instantiations of these considerations. Yeah, so this is, particularly what you call as a probe. Uh, yeah, so we have a question. Uh, the diagnostic classifier essentially works on the learned model weights of the sentences. Yes, that is right. So it could happen that, uh, so data is typically, you can have typically different data as well. That's okay too, um, but Ideally, you would want data to be similar. So let's say if you're training your actual model to do sentence classification, sorry, to do sentiment classification on movie reviews, but you have, let's say, a completely different data set about tenses, you can still do it, but it is preferable that you have the labels on the same training examples. So, I'm going to give you some flavors of this probing technique applied to lots of different examples. So one particular example is to understand whether neural machine translation learns about syntax. Uh, so this particular paper in 2016 tries to understand five different syntactic properties, like whether word representations capture their part of speech tags, whether the sentence representation captures voice, tense, and so on. And uh, they built five different models. One of them is a very simple model called E2E, which means English to English. So you have a source sentence and you just copy the same sentence. So I like it becomes I like it. Uh, they also have two versions, which is English to French and English to German, which are respective translation systems. There's also a different system for permuted English to permuted English, which basically permutes the source sentence 
and tries to reproduce the same permutation of the source sentence. So this is just done as a way to confound for languageness in actual English. So just to differentiate whether the words matter or the actual sequence matters. So they have this as a baseline. You will see why this is useful. They also have an E2P model, which is an English to linearized parse tree. So what it does is that actually takes a source sentence like I like it, and it tries to actually give a sequence, which is a linearized parse tree of it. So this particular model E2P should know a lot of syntax to be able to actually give me the parse tree. The first model E2E or PE2PE, I hope that they don't have to know syntax so well because all they need to do is just copy the sentence. So is the setup clear so far? Any questions? Okay, great. So this is just the tense experiment. If you see that the majority class baseline, which is the active class, the accuracy of that model is 82.8. .8. The English to English model gives us 82.7, which is not better than the majority class baseline. But on the other hand, the English to French model gives us 92.8. .8. So this is providing some evidence that models which learn to translate English into French do encode a notion of tense because you can decode it better than majority class. On English to English, you cannot do better. So this is the same test, but for five different syntactic properties, which we looked at. And uh, on the x-axis are those five different models, which we tested. And uh, we see two bars. So the bars to the left are the first layer activations. The bar to the right are the second layer activations. So if you notice that, so first things first, you would notice that E2P and E2F, E2G models, which actually do English to parse trees or English to French German translations, they capture much more syntax than models which do E2E or permuted English to permuted English. This is largely true for from all the five graphs that we see. So the left three bars are typically higher than the right two bars. Furthermore, uh, you might notice that for tasks like voice and tense, which are more sentence level tasks, the right bars are slightly bigger than the left bars. This is because uh, there is some sort of hierarchical encoding of information. So as you go higher and higher up the layers, it is conjectured that you would have more information that is more abstract, more global about the sentence. Whereas if you are at much lower layers, there is more information about let's say the words. So in pause tagging experiment, for instance, you would see that the left bars are slightly higher than the right bars. This is providing some evidence to this conjecture that as you move higher up the layers, you capture more abstract representations. Like you would have seen a lot of examples and images for that, for instance, like the first few layers of CNNs capture some edges. As you keep going deeper, you see maybe more faces because now you're composing edges and so on. So another experiment, uh, so there is a question that what was the tense classifier used in this experiment? The actual classifier used was a simple logistic regression. Uh, and we will actually discuss a little bit of this, that how does choosing a classifier affect the performance? Like what classifier should you choose when you're trying to diagnose? So we'll come back to this a little bit, but in this experiment, they used a logistic regression. And that's why they also could see that what were the top 10 dimensions and they also have numbers for just the top 10 dimensions. Um, this is an interesting paper. So if you're curious, you should definitely check it out. So 
this was another experiment which comes from the same group so what they're trying to see is whether you can capture the length of what you have encoded and what you have decoded for instance let's say you're trying to produce an english to french translation uh, at a certain time step do you know how many words you have encoded till now and let's say after you have decoded some french words do you know how many more words should you decode so this is a probe for just testing whether the encoder or decoder understands length and surprisingly so they find one particular unit the 109th unit which was very correlated with length in the sense that as you can see as you encode more and more this particularly the blue curve goes monotone is monotonically decreasing and um, on the right it is monotonically increasing it's as if this particular unit is trying to keep a count of how many words i've consumed versus how many words i've emitted and if you kill this particular guy as in if you hide if you mask out unit 109 you are still able to predict length because there exist other units which do the same thing so there is a significant amount of redundancy in this setup uh, and in fact in a lot of setups there is a decent amount of redundancy so typically you would observe that if you kill or mask the top discriminating dimensions you would still be able to get a good amount of information out because there are multiple units that are keeping track of these things uh so there is also an interesting paper which shows that lstms can actually count whereas gru's cannot count what i mean is let's say if you actually feed in a binary sequence of let's say aas and bbs let's say the sequence is aaab and the task is to predict how many number of as you have seen so in this case the answer should be 3 so if you train an lstm to do this versus if you train a gru to do this you would empirically observe that lstms are much better in generalizing to much much longer sequences so let's say if you train only for sentences with sequence length 50 you will notice that lstms are actually much better at generalizing it's a very fun experiment you can maybe go try this at home and uh, you can also with a bit of math show that this is obvious uh, so if you write down the equations of the input output forget gates of lstms and grus you will notice that lstms have this ability to increment by 1 or they at least can get some weights that will allow you to always increment by 1 if they see a particular symbol whereas grus do not have that ability and if you write down the equations clearly you should be able to show this if not you can check out this reference which shows this uh yeah any questions so far or anything interesting you would like to share yeah okay so these were some experiments on machine translation a lot of people have looked at that a lot of tasks use general sentence embeddings these could be let's say representations coming from averaging the word vectors or hidden states from lstms and this was this paper was back in 2017 so not many people like i don't think there was i think transformers was introduced after this paper a little after this paper and definitely it was not as popular as it is now so a lot of people still used representations like word vector averaging hidden states of the lstms and so on so this paper particularly tries to do a fine grained analysis on sentence embeddings and they try to see just these three properties and see whether these sentence representations learn the length of the sentence the order of the words in the sentence like sentence or analysis which of the two words in this particular sentence comes first or the content of the sentence for instance given a sentence embedding can you tell whether it had a word analysis in it or not so this particular paper develops 
experiments to test these properties. And they find that hidden states of LSTM capture to a great deal all three properties, length, word, order, and content. And very surprisingly, they find that even models that simply average word vectors, they capture the content, the length, and even the word order. So think about it. A model that simply averages all the word embeddings knows about the length of the sentence. It's actually taking the mean of all the word embeddings, but it still knows the length of the sentence. Like you can predict the length of the sentence significantly better than random chance. Again, like, do you want to guess why this would be the case? Like anybody, any ideas? Any thought experiments? Mm. So one idea is that most embedding dimensions might be sparse. Uh, so if number of words increase, Yes, so this could have been a good idea if the representations were actually sparse. If there were sparse representations and you average them, then maybe the sparsity of the average vector gives away the length. But in this particular paper, the representations were not sparse, but it's a good idea nonetheless. So there's a question that averaging destroys length information. That is actually like, this paper claims otherwise. It suggests that averaging still has a lot more length information than what you would find by random guessing. So there is another very interesting suggestion, maybe specific words or specific values in some dimensions. And it can thus look at those dimensions and know that, okay, whether these words are actually present and those words are indicative of the sentence lengths. So this is, I think, very specific to the sparse example, uh, sparse idea. So it could work if this condition was actually true, but in most settings, it is unlikely to be true. So there are multiple things which are going on. One of the reasons which the authors give is that their norms are actually very correlated with the sentence length. So for if your norms are very small, then that means you have sentences which are longer. So these are norms of averaged word vectors. So one reason which the authors give explaining this phenomena is that you can think of all these word vectors as random variables in a high dimensional space with means across zero. So as in, as in when you get more and more of these words, you will try to converge to the mean by central limit theorem and Hofding's inequality that if you have more words, you are more likely to be closer to the average. And hence, if you have longer sentences, your averaged norms would actually be closer to zero. This makes sense. There can also be some other reasons. So typically what people have observed that when you actually train word to wit models, you might have noticed that frequent words have a larger embedding norm and shorter sentences will likely have more frequent words than longer sentences relatively. Uh, so that can also give away the length of the sentence. And that's why you might observe that the norm is higher for smaller sentences, whereas it's lower for the larger sentences. Uh, so long sentences don't have, uh, so there is another suggestion that it might be due to the fact that 
longer sentences have gradient updates that are small so these models were not trained in a sentence wise fashion these are actually you take word to vec embeddings and you average them to get a sentence representation so these models are actually word based models just averaged to use sentence representations but the reason why frequent words have higher norms is because since they are frequent they have to have higher dot products with more context words and hence uh, more of their dimensions are larger in magnitude okay so i think in acl 2017 a remuni was very uh, against the idea that you could use a single vector to actually encode the whole meaning of the sentence and uh, he very eloquently quoted this and some people went on and tried to back this up and see what actually happens if they take a lot of properties so they want to try lots and lots of properties like can i understand what is the depth of my syntax tree just by looking at sentence representation and so on so they design 10 probing tasks and they test all the popular models in 2018 and they found out that indeed a lot of these models were capturing most of these probing properties to a great deal so it was very surprising to know that even though none of these models were actually trained to do any of these tasks particularly they did have a lot of information about let's say what was the depth of the tree or whether a particular biogram was inverted in the sentence or not uh okay so so far so good let's also try to see where things can go wrong when doing probing so one of the recent papers which probably also relates to some of the discussion here is what is going on in the classifier so since i am also so what is going on in the classifier in the sense that i am supervising my diagnostic classifier to also do a task let's say predict tense what happens if my probing classifier itself learns the task to give you a very extreme example let's say the representation that you were working with comes from your camera and let's say you build a probing classifier which is a deep resnet and now you are able to let's say identify a cat versus a dog this would definitely not mean that your camera is smart enough to know which one is a cat or a dog it just has all the information in it uh so we need to be able to like disambiguate these two things like did i interpret my representations right or did my probing classifiers learn the task itself so for this very specific reason uh, most of these probing classifiers as somebody points out also is very shallow most of the probing classifiers are very very lightweight so that they don't memorize the task itself let's say if you are models if your probing models could if your representation was let's say lossless your probing model could actually learn the task itself and suggest that yeah a lot of information about knowing which one is a dog or which one is not a dog is captured very well um in the representations so we need to be able to control for this so this particular paper suggests one technique one of the recent techniques to control for this is this very interesting paper on minimum description length now the techniques proposed are fairly involved so i won't go into the great detail but i encourage you to check this paper out to summarize this at a very high level what this paper actually accounts for is not just the final quality of your probe but how hard it is to actually train that probe in the sense that how much data do you need what is your classifier type and uh, a lot of this can be captured in terms of information theory uh, so they have a very nice setup where you can actually quantify these 
aspects of how much effort does it actually take for you to build that probe and we had one more question earlier which suggested that if the embeddings were trained instead returned by bert would the correlation with length still hold since the embeddings would then not be entirely random so here to uh, the embeddings are not entirely random these are embeddings trained from word to word and uh, if you actually average classification if you average let's say individual representation from a given layer from bird i suspect that you would feel you would see a similar phenomena i haven't myself done that experiment so can't say for sure but i believe that you would see that phenomena also a lot of these embeddings have positional information in terms of positional embeddings so that also probably gives away the positions and if you are later averaging and you know that one of the averaged quantities had a position 17 then probably you know at least there were 17 sentences and so on so my guess is that you should be able to get that okay so the survey that you read also had a very nice visualization probably later in the text which had this giant table compiling maybe 50 papers all inspecting different components of of neural models uh, and trying to see what properties are captured or not and this has been a very like uh, fast field a lot of people have built a lot of probing techniques and a lot of uh, probing methods to detect certain properties or the other yeah so this particular table has a nice summary so let's move on to the next section and before we get there if there are any questions uh, feel free to ask this would be a good time uh yeah so another important point and thanks for bringing this up is that a lot of this these classifiers actually only show that uh you can decode let's say tense information so it only shows that it only claims about correlation but not causation most of the interpretability literature does not talk about causation one thing to understand is that a lot of these neural models built for tasks like reading comprehension machine translation they are purely associational so they associate one like one particular variable let's say dimension in x to a, let's say certain values in y and these are mere associations deriving any co any causal insights from it is like fundamentally hard because of this problem because these machines are not causal models so you cannot make causal claims uh, all the claims have to be only correlation claims that yeah indeed this information was encoded in the representations but it's an important point to keep in mind okay so let's talk about the second part if there are other questions uh, please feel free to post them so the second part of the talk is about can you explain this particular outcome can you tell me why my loan was denied can you tell me why i didn't get that fellowship uh, so this is also a very booming field it's relatively new but there have been a lot of interesting steps in this direction uh and uh, one key question that has been grippling this field is that how do you evaluate an explanation for instance i tell you that okay your loan was denied because of so and so reasons how do you know that i'm not making this up or how do you know that actually whatever somebody gave me was actually an end product of models prediction in the sense that how do i know whether the actual explanation the explanation i gave you is 
in some way motivated by the reasoning or the flow of computation that happens in the neural model so this is the question of faithfulness in the sense that how do i know that the explanation is actually faithful to the model's decision making so one way there are lots of thoughts to how to evaluate this one way which we could come up with to evaluate an explanation is this so let's say you have two sets of people uh, one is the set in the above and the other is the set below so to the first set you only show them input examples and the outcomes and to the set below you show them input examples the output or and an explanation so you give them multiple triples like maybe 100 examples with outputs and explanations those explanations could be anything it could be oh i believe the answer is this because of this or it could be let's say attention scores or gradients or anything so your explanation could be anything and uh, you can let's say supplement your input output with explanations in the with the second group of people now they are asked to do this they are asked that all of you have to come up with a model of the model in the sense that you have to understand what the model is doing and later i will quiz you to see whether you understand what the model is doing so you let's say if you're reading sentiment classification reviews uh, you have to basically guess whether the model will actually say it's a positive review or a negative review based on some training that you undergo looking at some input output examples in the first case and in the second case you also have explanations and now at test time you have to guess so if the people below are able to better guess on newer inputs that means the explanations were helpful to them in understanding the model itself and this is measurable you can actually measure the improvements that people below get to the people above so this is one operational one way to operationalize the definition of interpretability that we talked about uh, so you give them explanations and you see if people can generalize better with explanations even when they don't have explanations any questions about this setup so this is one setup like this is very interesting and this is still like we are thinking more about it but it's not like it is definitely not a commonly used thing and uh, it's right now also requires humans so we are also thinking about how could one automate uh, people here like for instance you could use different models instead of people here so there's a question that regarding the explanations itself is it possible that people are also able to form associations yes so definitely uh, there is a lot of knowledge that people have and they can themselves see that yeah this this particular review looks positive the assumption here is that in both these settings we assume that people have similar knowledge so the only difference between people above and people below is the explanation so if people below are able to drastically do the task better then we can say that probably the explanations were good that helped them understand these associations better to actually get the predictions and guess accurately at test time so one let's now dive deep into some of the explanation techniques one very popular explanation technique is called lime it stands for lo locally interpretable model agnostic explanations uh, so what this does is let's say that bold plus point is what you want to explain and this is 
uh, the decision boundary that is drawn in 2D space. This is a very notational diagram. What you would do is you will try to sample points around this given point. So you would want to sample points around this point such that you sample more if the points are nearby. So nearby circles are bigger. And what you intend to do, what this technique proposes to do is now using just the sampling around these points, you build a simple interpretable model, which is a proxy model to the actual model, which is only locally relevant. So this straight line, which has been built, it's a linear classifier, which you can go and interpret. But this particular line is only relevant for the points here. It is not relevant for other points far away from this point. So that's why it is local in nature. And using this technique, you can now interpret the linear classifier by looking at the coefficients. So like this particular, they demonstrated the applicability of their technique on some qualitative examples. So one of this example, for instance, is to understand whether this particular piece of content comes from a news group of Christianity versus atheism. And uh, this particular email was marked as atheism. And uh, funnily, like one of the biggest signal was that if you have an educational account, as per the data set, you are more likely to be an atheist than a Christian. And uh, like their locally interpretable model tells us that. So another technique which explains or tells you something about why a particular decision was made is to ask, can you give me a representative example from your training set that explains my prediction? This is asking like, this is the same thing as saying that, oh, if the other person with a similar profile was not denied alone, I should not be denied alone. So it's like saying that, in my training examples, I have, which I have all the data that I can learn from, these are the nearest examples that match your case. And maybe looking at those predictions, you can understand why I denied your loan. And the way, the, the way this paper particularly models this question is, they ask a mathematical question that among all the training points, which of the training point if removed from the training corpus would hurt me the most for this example. One way to do this is I could actually iteratively remove one training point at a time and see removing which training example hurts this example the most. And you can say that, okay, since this particular example hurts the most, this is most likely the most influential example. But like removing and retraining this networks is extremely computationally expensive. So a lot of, so this particular paper bor borrows techniques from old statistical tools like influence functions to approximate this. This is also a very interesting paper. It was, I think the best paper in ICML 2017. Uh, and again, I encourage you to read. Another explanation technique is attention. It has been very widely used. Like for instance, this is an example of entailment, like two dogs swim in a lake. This is the hypothesis. And the premise is that black dogs are frolicking around the grass together. And looking at the attention, you see that the attention is high on frolicking and grass. And it is a contradiction <clears throat> because you cannot be frolicking on the grass and swimming at the same time. So attention seems to give you what you would intuitively expect. Similarly, in the case of captioning, when you are actually decoding the word stop, attention is on the sign stop, which makes you think that, yes, it is giving me what I should be looking at. Similarly, people have used attention in all sorts of places. And even for BERT, a lot of people like to look at all sorts of attention heads. Uh, so it is very prominent way of trying to see what your model is doing for that particular example. However, there are lots of debates about whether attention is explanation or not. 
so this is one particular paper which was uh, which came out last year which suggested that attention is not explanation based on two arguments one of the argument was that attention is only mildly correlated with other important score techniques like line or gradient based techniques which we'll look at later so it is only mildly correlated and hence probably not an explanation the other sort of problematic argument was that if i actually change my attention my prediction should change but since it does not attention is not explanation so to think about it let's say if your initial attention was 0 0.2 0 0.2 0 0.6 uh, now if you change that attention to 0 0.2 0 0.1 0 0.7 if the actual first attention was sacred holy grail explanation then it should be the only right attention that will give me the correct answer any different attention will give me a different prediction or even different confidence scores and they show that you can find counterfactual attention which yields different predictions so there is nothing sacrosanct about the attention weights you have and hence they are not explanation and uh, clearly you are beginning to see a problem with this line of thought one is that first of all they manipulate attention post hoc in the sense that they look at attention and they say that okay what if attention was something else will it actually give me the same prediction they never question whether the new attention or the counterfactual attention is actually even possible to be attained like would a real model actually get me that attention ever and the other thing is which this paper which came after right after this if you haven't looked closely this is attention is not not explanation so this paper suggests that attention actually might be explanation and uh, attention scores can provide you one plausible way if not the attention or if not the explanation and often times in a lot of classification tasks that the previous paper has used they showed that attention wasn't even necessary in the sense that if you actually removed attention and did not have attention uh the drop was not significant and they said and they later said that since attention is not helping since you don't need it it is not explanation or the question of explanation doesn't arise and they also said that fixing the previous problem of this dangling attention that you only counterfactually change it they fixed that problem and they also said that yeah it is indeed manipulable and uh, they end the paper saying that like this should provide pause to researchers who are looking for attention distributions for one true faithful interpretation of the link to their model link of their model between the input and the output so clearly it's not very obvious that attention is or is not explanation also i don't particularly buy their claim that if attention is not useful the question of explanation doesn't make sense it's like saying that if l1 norm is not useful i can't have that interpretation that it has uh like just useful or not useful is not the yardstick and secondly let's say if it is actually useful and it actually helps you get better on additional 5% examples now you would use attention since it's useful to explain all your 100% examples not the additional 5% which you just got right because of attention so this is again very slippery slope uh, so a lot of these problems in our recent work we talked about and uh, our main premise was that indeed you can actually train models that give you similar predictions but have an altogether different attention map so the first example for instance tells you that looking at this biography of the person it decides that this person in question is a physician and not a surgeon and it does so by actually looking and accounting for gender and in this particular data set and in real world also unfortunately there are far more male surgeons than female surgeons so any classifiers that you 
actually built for predicting physician for predicting surgeons versus other physicians you will notice that gender is indeed a key factor so the first model actually looks at the gender as is depicted by the attention also whereas we show that you could manipulate attention and build a fresh model which now does not look at attention which which sorry which now does not look at gender and gets the same predictions all the time in the sense that it actually does take into account gender just that its attention is not high on gender and we show that these manipulated models are actually better than no attention models so anybody who is an adversary who is trying to let's say whitewash problematic features in their system could manipulate attention such that it has actually low mass on all the problematic features while at the same time taking advantages of all these features so this is important to take into account especially when you are let's say auditing models you want to see whether this model was actually gender sensitive or not and we showed a lot of examples to people and they said that our models were not gender sensitive because the attention was not high but indeed they were capturing a lot of gender and we also show uh, a lot of work arounds how actually manipulation of attention works behind the scenes uh, so if you're interested feel free to check out there are other techniques like gradient based scores uh, like maybe at some point of time you might have used some of these techniques so one of the technique is that you actually take the gradient of your loss here the score by your input and multiply it by the input to get the product of gradient times input the other thing you could do is do integrated gradients it's also a very popular technique very prevalent in image uh, very prevalent in vision literature what this does is it actually starts from a base image like a black image so the x i bar is the pixel corresponding to the black image which is all black what it essentially suggests is that you take the ingredient you take the gradient and you integrate it across all the points from starting from black to where your image is so it is trying to explain it's trying to basically give you a much more smoother um perspective or attribution than just looking at one small neighborhood of that point and again to note that these are all very very local interpretations so should be like interpreted as such gradients only tell you how the models will behave in infinitely decimal small neighborhood around that point nothing far away from that point and for a lot of language examples anything that any human being would ever write is typically far away from that point so a lot of gradient based attributions for natural language processing are like not very well grounded so the last explanation technique that we are going to go through is called extractive rational generation so on the right you have let's say a review about a beer which has multiple aspects to it like did you like the ambience of the place where you had the beer did you like the color did you like so you have to rate the beer review on multiple aspects like ambience and so on and uh, so you have this multi aspect sentiment analysis data set and now you have to essentially answer the question that why was this particular review uh rated so high on color and uh, a typical answer would be that like a highlighted portion of the text which suggests so so what they propose uh, i forgot the citation here uh, did i okay so what this particular paper proposes is that you actually start with the input and you generate a binary mask of ones and zeros for the length of the sentence so let's say the length of the sentence is 5 you will generate a binary mask like 11000 which tells that the first two words are your explanation and 
once you have generated this explanation a discriminator or an encoder just looks at these two words and tries to make the same prediction as you would have if you had access to all the tokens at first your generator is arbitrary so it randomly picks up from a uniform distribution but as you train this generator and encoder jointly you will like this is trained using reinforce uh like this paper suggests that you can get very good explanations or very good subsets which are predictive in the sense that the mask that you attain now by itself gives you similar performance as you would get on the full text so this is essentially telling you that whatever you have got is predictive and uh, this in practice is very hard to train as you would imagine and uh, so there are a lot of like practical issues with actually making this work so yeah this is i think the broad sense of oar interpretability literature is so far to very quickly summarize the two directions uh the first part talks about what the model is learning this is to get a global sense of the model typically you would have a model and a component that you want to investigate with a particular linguistic property and you would build a diagnostic classifier or a di or diagnostic regression tool to understand whether that property is captured and the evaluation is implicit in the sense that you know directly that yes this particular property was captured because my accuracy is 92% on the other hand when you're trying to explain a prediction a lot of things are not that simple there are multiple techniques and the evaluation is also very complicated yeah so this is it and what we need from here is better tools to evaluate so that we can reach a stage where we will be able to update our models based on explanations so that's it from my side and happy to answer questions yeah so could i repeat about why gradients are not informative for nlp applications so what gradients typically give us is like actually making an infinitely decimal infinitely small change to the input how would my output let's say loss behave so that particular quantity is only valid for that small neighborhood and since the manifolds of a lot of these networks are intensely complex you cannot approximate that same gradient to a point that is far away like you cannot say for instance that actually like any any new sentence that you will actually encounter in real life will be much farther away from that point so the concept of local neighborhood is not very clean in like text as compared to images so in images you can very well say that if i let's say made this pixel slightly more dark what would happen that would probably be a small neighborhood but like slightly more dark word like it doesn't translate very well to nlp does it make sense yeah and if there are more questions i'm happy to share and